Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the public lecture hosted by KIPAC, or the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. My name is Sinan Du. I am the Outreach and Engagement Manager at KIPAC, and I will be hosting today's event with my co-host, Dan Wilkins. So it's really, really excited to see you all here, uh, both in person and online. Um, we're very excited to actually present another three-part lecture series, uh, this time focusing on dark matter detections. And uh, this is actually a topic that many of you indicated interest in your survey response. And we thought, okay, well, this is also something we do. Um, so it's actually very exciting that we are uh, presenting all our current findings and progress to you um, in the three lectures. Um, so, well, whenever you think about uh, research on dark matter, it is actually quite interdisciplinary. Um, it ranges from particle physics to astrophysics and also to cosmology. And it actually requires expertise from all different kinds of fields and um, uh, subfields, including theory, observations, computing, and instrumentation. So in this three-part lecture series, you will actually be hearing the first two lectures on how we're building experiments to actually search for dark matter candidate particles um, in different ways. And the third lecture, we'll be talking about how we are possibly finding dark matter from different sources and systems in the sky. Um, in this lecture, we're very excited to kick it off with wave-like dark matter, which I didn't even know before joining KIPAC, so I'm also very excited to learn it, uh, learn about it all with you. So before um, I introduce the speaker, I would also like to give a very big shout out to the entire team who is supporting this event behind the scene. And these include the chat moderators um, that we have on YouTube, uh, who are all subject matter experts in this field and will be helping moderating the YouTube chat. So I'll let them very briefly introduce themselves. First, we have Nicholas. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicholas. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at Stanford, I work in the same group as Maria, the speaker, so I also work on dark matter detection and experimentation. Great. Thank you, Nicholas. And Nicholas will also be here in person after the whole presentation is done, if you want to just chat with him very casually. Uh, next, we have Richie. Hi, everyone. I'm Richie. I'm also a fourth year here at KIPAC, working with Risa Wexler. I mainly model dwarf galaxy star formation, how they form with dark matter simulations and galaxy handle collection modeling. Great. Thanks very much, Richie. And finally, we have Katie. Hi, um, I'm Katie. I'm also a fourth year graduate student uh, at Stanford, um, and I also work with Maria. I mainly work on um, making quantum devices to help read out these dark matter experiments. Cool. Thank you all. Um, for all of the, you joining us in person, um, we kindly ask you to save all your questions towards the very end where we will have the Q&A. And of course, you're also more than welcome to chat with Maria after this presentation, you know, in a very casual and informal way. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, you will see that there is a YouTube live chat on the right-hand side of uh, the page. Um, the chat moderators will be answering most of the questions in there as they come in, and the rest of the questions will be addressed by Maria during the Q&A. So we welcome all kinds of questions uh, in there and also encourage you to engage in discussions, but kindly ask you to be respectful to others. Okay. So I guess uh, now it is my pleasure and the big moment to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Maria Simonovskaya. Uh, Maria is a postdoctoral researcher here at KIPAC working on building cutting edge instruments, um, searching for dark matter, um, specifically axion dark matter. Um, Maria is actually a local to the Bay Area. She got her bachelor's degree and also PhD from UC Berkeley before joining KIPAC at Stanford. Um, Maria's uh, research has mainly been on uh, building instruments, so more on the hands-on side, 
And one particular fact I like about it is uh, Maria started her journey in physics by starting in a lab um, and studying how the impurities of diamonds could possibly affect the sensitivity of detectors. So sometimes I also imagine myself working in environments full of diamonds. But Maria had this uh, luxury to do that. So without further ado, let's welcome Maria. There, clicker. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's very nice to be here today, and thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm very excited to share with you some of the things that I work on and um, study. Yes. Uh, have you guys heard or who understands or who understands the uh, why dark matter should exist here? Great. Perfect. I was told that most people would already know this information, so I, I limited my introductory slides, but I still kept them in there just in case. So not everyone raised their hand, um, so I'm very glad. My presentation's gone. Oh, no. Nice. Okay. Okay, so I am building specifically a um, dark matter radio to try to detect dark matter. Um, so in this talk, I'll uh, explain a little bit about what dark matter is, why it should exist, um, and why, I guess, how we're, how we're trying to look for it. Um, first, uh, dark matter. Uh, it seems like it's something dark, uh, so which means you, we can't see it. And if we can't see it, how do we know it's there? Um, well, we can see its interactions with the things around it. Um, for example, uh, this is stars moving around in our galaxy. Uh, top left corner shows the year so it's it's kind of sped up um and here you okay it zooms in and we look at one of the um or at, at the the motion of these light things of these stars and even though um clearly nothing we can't see anything in the in in the middle of the trajectory of that of that star um we can kind of like have a sense that there is something there um, so in this case, it's a black hole, um, but dark matter is something, I guess, we similarly see an effect of, of, of the dark matter. Um, so the dark matter story starts in the 1930s, um, where a few people, including this guy, Fritz Zwicky, uh, looked um, up in space and observed strange motions that they didn't expect. He looked at uh, stellar motion in the coma cluster, and he noticed that things were moving around and it didn't make sense how they were moving around given everything else that he saw. So he was like, there's more matter than what we can see. Um, and he called it dark matter, but not in English. And I guess, as you can imagine at the time, people, did, they weren't ready to accept this concept. And um, so then we waited a few more years. We waited a few more years. <laughs> and, um, let this continue. Okay, 1960s. Um, Vera Rubin, oh no, go back. That's fine. Vera Rubin looked at. Um, galaxy rotation of like spiral galaxies. So how stars are moving around in a spiral galaxy. And she noticed that, or she did similar uh, calculations. She measured the velocity of these stars moving around in the, in the spiral galaxies. Um, and she measured them pretty well, pretty conclusively well. What we expected, what she expected to see is, um, great. 
okay, oh, okay. Um, is so the, okay. The bottom, the x x axis is the distance away from the center of the galaxy, and then the y axis is the velocity. So what she expected to see is this uh, dashed curve, where as you go further away from the center of the galaxy, um, things should slow down. But what she saw. Um, as she went further, as, as she, she looked at stars that were further away from the center of the galaxy, um, she didn't see their velocity change. And if you calculate how much gravity there is putting, pulling, um, keeping these stars in orbit um, versus how fast they're going and like the, the force that they experience from going around really fast, um, they really shouldn't stay in orbit. Um, it doesn't make sense why the galaxies even held together. And so based on these observations, um, people were convinced that there is matter that we don't see that provides the gravity to keep um, these spiral galaxies in uh, together rather than flying apart. Um, fast forward to today, there's much more um, convincing evidence that dark matter should exist. So that includes these galaxy rotation curves. Um, it also includes gravitational lensing. So we can see how light moves around in space and it gets bent by the gravitational interactions it experiences along its path um, or nearby its path. And so just by taking pictures of, of uh, various parts of the universe, we can see that the matter or that the light has been bent in, uh, in ways that we wouldn't expect unless there was matter that we didn't see. Um, also the cosmic microwave background, um, uh, although it's approximately one temperature, there's some variations in the cosmic microwave background that um, I guess if you put dark matter into the equation, you can predict these variations pretty well. So that's how we can get a sense of also how much dark matter there might be. Um, so what do we know about this mysterious dark matter? We know that it's dark. It doesn't absorb or emit light that we can see. Um, it, we know that it's matter. It's massive. It interacts gravitationally with the world. Um, and we know that there must be a lot of it. Uh, specifically, there must be five times more dark matter than there is the light matter that we see, all of the things that we know. There's also dark energy in the universe, uh, which is something even more complicated that I'm not going to go into, but most of the things around us are a mystery. Um, we also know about dark matter that it cannot be what we know, like it cannot be composed of the standard model particles that we have. So we got to look beyond the standard model, or we got to add things to the standard model, which is still beyond. Um, so dark matter candidates, uh, there are few, or there are many dark matter candidates. There are many things that it could be that we don't know if these things exist or not. Um, and there's a huge uh, mass range of what each particle or each uh, entity of dark matter uh, might be. And so here you see an axis, it's a uh, mass in electron volts, EV. And one EV uh, is about 10 to the minus 36 kilogram to give you a sense of uh, how much that is. Um, something around, okay, something less than one EV, we consider light dark matter. And something heavier, uh, we consider heavier or higher than one EV, we call it, we consider heavier dark matter, heavy dark matter. Um, but even this heavy dark matter is still a lot less than like the macroscopic objects that we see in, in our lives. Um, to give an example of candidate particles in each of these regions, um, in the light dark matter side, one of the strongest, um, I think the strongest, candidate is the axion. So its mass is around 10 to the minus six, but really there's a wide range that it could be um, around there. And then in the, on the heavy dark matter side, um, perhaps you've heard of giant uh, underground detectors um, that are, are trying to search for dark matter. I think that's what's really popular. I guess that's, what's, that, that's what a lot of people have been searching for 
um, in terms of like the dark matter community. So they're searching for things like WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particle. They are not as good clearly the, as axions, but uh, because they haven't found them and they worked so hard to, to search for them already. Um, and that's they're on the order of uh, the mass of a xenon atom. So that's kind of similar to something that we have some sense of compared to axions, which are much lighter than anything we, we really uh, understand. Um, so what do we not know about dark matter? We don't know exactly how much uh, each of this uh, piece of dark matter weighs, um, but it could be this light dark matter. And the light dark matter, um, it's so light that it, it mostly behaves like a wave um, or a field. And then the heavy dark matter, it's, it's more like a particle. So like a xenon atom really behaves a lot, a lot of time like a particle. So like the WIMP dark matter could interact with this, could bump into things kind of like a particle could. And um, if you're uncomfortable uh, with the uh, concept that it might be wave-like or particle-like, um, I'd like to remind you that maybe you've heard that light can have um, both particle and wave-like properties at, different, at, at times. Um, and its particle-like nature is exhibited in, for example, the photoelectric effect, where we shine a light um, onto a material and the light actually uh, causes the material to emit electrons. Um, but if we just increase the intensity of the light, that doesn't cause uh, the electrons to be emitted. It, you have to actually change like the frequency. We have to change the energy of the individual photons to be able to um, emit those electrons. So that's really like a particle nature of like a photon, like knocking off an electron. Um, on the other hand, uh, light also behaves like a wave, where if you shine a, a, a light at a slit, um, a wall with two holes in it, um, on the screen behind it, instead of seeing two, um, uh, I guess, pieces of light um, coming through the slit, you see an interference pattern, which means that the light is kind of, has this quantum nature uh, behaves like a wave. It goes kind of through both slits at the same time. Um, so if light can behave like a particle in a wave, light uh, particles can also behave like that. And actually the double slit experiment has been done with like atoms and electrons. So it's not just because light doesn't have mass that it behaves like a wave. Um, so again, what do we not know um, about the dark matter. We don't know how much each piece of dark matter weighs. Um, and we can only guess at how else it interacts with our world other than gravitationally. Like we see its gravitational effects, but um, we can make assumptions um, on what other interactions it might have. And theorists propose dark matter candidates um, and the, the ones that are more popular, um, the ones that make sense, is ones that have a different starting point. So ones that also solve another mystery in physics other than just the missing matter of the universe. And another mystery, one example of this other mystery is uh, the neutron is missing an electric dipole moment. Our standard model predicts the neutron, although it's a neutral um, piece of, uh, it, although it's neutral in general, it should have some kind of separation of charges. Um, and the separation of charges is this electro, electric dipole moment. And so we can, based on our theory, based on our standard model, we can predict um, what the size of that electric dipole moment might be. Uh, the neutron also has a magnetic dipole moment, which is like a, a charge moving around in a circle. Um, so it should have both magnetic dipole moment, no problem, it has, we've seen it. Um, but the electric dipole moment, uh, we really haven't seen it. We, so we predict it to be something like 10 to the minus 16 um, electron centimeters. But um, 
experiments have tried to measure this and they've gotten so good at trying to measure it that they've excluded their sensitivity is 10 orders of magnitude less um, than what we expect it to be. So we don't have a good, or there's no conclusively good reason why it should be this way. Why is this neutron missing an electric dipole moment? There's nothing that doesn't allow it to, to not have one, but it's kind of strange that it doesn't. So in 1977, um, Pechi and Quinn solved this or proposed a solution to this mystery. Um, and the, the, the proposition was to introduce a new particle called the axion. They actually named it after this detergent um, because it cleaned up this theory so well. And um, conveni or conveniently for, I get, I'm not con conveniently, okay. Um, this new particle, the axion, based on the properties that it has considering or that it solves this um, mystery of the missing uh, neutron electric dipole moment, it can also be dark matter. It naturally can be produced in the universe um, uh, just like everything else was produced or in a different way, but like everything else happened to be produced, it is, it is a natural, I guess, particle. And here's me with Helen Quinn um, in Berkeley a few years ago. So it feels real, you know, it's uh, not some, some old thing in the past. Um, so what do we know about axions? We know that they're extremely light um, and the mass, so it's part of this light dark matter. It's part of this like wave-like dark matter um, group of candidates, um, probably the strongest one. And, um, it can interact with a few things, but uh, only a little bit. So it, can, it could interact with like nucleons, electrons, photons, but only a tiny, tiny little bit. Um, and specifically uh, what we, I guess, an, a very useful interaction is its interaction to two photons. Um, so there's the axion and the, I guess this, this uh, vertex, uh, so a little photon, so the axion interacts with two, two, with two photons, all right. Unfortunately, uh, we don't know what the axion mass is. Again, we know that it's very light, but it still could span a few orders of magnitude. So we don't know exactly where to look for it. Um, and like I said, there's a wide range of possibilities for what this could be. Um, on the x-axis here is the axion mass measured in UV, like the, the previous mass um, scale. Um, and on the y-axis, it's the coupling strength to two photons. So it's how strongly does it couple to two photons? We also don't know how strongly it couples to two photons. We just kind of can predict that it should couple a little bit. Um, the popular axion models actually lie on this uh, diagonal line where it says KSVZ, DFSZ. Uh, those are like initials of people that proposed those specific axion models. Um, but as you, so there are some bounds in gray here. Um, the axion can't be there. Um, that's partially from um, cosmological observations. So we know how axions should interact um, on large, like in terms of like cooling of stars or cooling of supernova. Um, and so if we see a supernova, we can kind of calculate how many axions there may have been if they had certain couplings. So we have some bounds on what the ax where the axion can't be, but there's still a very large range of masses where they could be. And to check that whole range takes a long time and it's hard, but that's what we're trying to do. Um, so how do we begin to probe this wide range that the axion might be? Uh, can we look in space and try to see the axion like decay into two photons? Well, if you calculate, I guess, the, the cross section, like how likely an axion is to decay into two photons, even though we don't know exactly how likely it is, we can, we kind of have some sort of, sort of sense. Um, we see that the axion would decay into two photons at once in every like 10 to the 47 years. That's the life, okay, the lifetime, maybe not once, but that's the lifetime of the axion in terms of this decay. Compared to the age of the universe, um, it's a long time. 
Um, and we can't wait around that long to try to look for this. So it's not a very good way to look for the axion. Um, so in 1983, just a few years after we, I guess, the axion was proposed and we realized that this was not a good way to look for axions, he proposed um, another, uh, a way to detect it through a, a resonant um, search. And how does that resonant search work? Um, so we have a magnetic field, a magnet. So these, uh, these dots are like wires coming out of the board and then the crosses are like wires going into the board. So this is like a solenoid. So a, a, a wire wound in a loop. Um, and when you have a wire going in a loop, then that creates a magnetic, a magnetic field by the right-hand rule, I guess, pointing upwards. Um, so these are magnetic field lines. The magnetic field, um, so a photon or light is like an oscillating electromagnetic field. We're already approximately comfortable with the photon or the light being a wave. Um, and half of that is a magnetic field. So a magnetic field kind of looks like um, a photon, um, mathematically, at least half a photon. And that's really important because the axion interacts with this magnetic field. It interacts with this virtual photon um, to create a real photon. Um, but, uh, so this can happen like in a resonator, um, but the axion will only like interact with this or the, inter the interaction of the axion with the magnetic field will be enhanced if the axion mass is on resonance with the resonance frequency of this resonator. Um, so the resonance condition is this energy equals mc squared. Um, and that's also equal to a constant times the frequency. So that's how the frequency of uh, the photon that the axion produces, which is also the resonant frequency of the, cav of the, of the resonator, um, matches the mass of the axion. Okay, to be a little bit more comfortable with resonance frequencies, uh, if you have a rope tied between two walls, um, you can find like a kind of like a physical resonance of that rope. So here I have some examples of like resonance uh, resonances that that rope can have. Um, and Another uh, example of resonances in our lives is like a radio, um, which can be tuned. Um, and then when its resonant fre frequency hits the frequency of a station, then we hear, we pick up that station and hear it um, and we can play it. Um, and again, the resonance condition is this uh, energy that is related to the axion mass times the speed of light. And then there's a constant times the frequency. So that relation is really important for us to be able to interact with the axion. Um, so now that the axion has converted its energy into a photon inside the resonator, um, we can stick an antenna um, or some kind of uh, pickup uh, to, and then send it through a, a readout chain. So we can read out the signal that we see. So really um, we would be reading out noise or zero until we hit the frequency of the axion. So we need to be able to tune the frequency of the resonator um, to search for axions of different masses. Um, and on the plot on the bottom left, um, so there's the frequency on the x-axis and power. So power, for example, that we're measuring um, in some kind of resonant structure. Um, and so we have to check one frequency at a time until we hit the resonance condition. Um, and then we can see a signal above the noise. Uh, the noise is contributed by a few things, uh, which I'll talk about. Um, one of the things that contributes to the noise is temperature. So if something's really hot, things are moving around. And if we cool things down, things are moving around less. So there's less uncertainty about at least where everything is, um, but less of this thermal noise. So we, we really have to make sure to cool things down pretty well. 
Um, there are many experiments using this kind of uh, similar technique uh, to search for the axion. And these are some examples of experiments around the world looking for the axion. Um, I guess I can I can talk about. So on the on the leftmost side is called ADMX uh, axion dark matter experiment. Very good name. Um, and that's like the outside of its. Uh, that's the, the outside of the the the, fr the fr refrigerator. Um, and then some of the other ones kind of see that you can see the inside. So like there's the the resonators um, that are hanging off of these golden plates. And the golden plates work to cool um, inside of that, I guess, cylinder of ADMX. Um, so I work on DM radio, um, and DM radio is trying to search for the axion like these other experiments. Um, DM radio is composed of a few universities around the US, and um, we're hosted at Stanford and Slack. So this is our, our main base. We're actually trying to build our experiments, um, one on campus, one at Slack, um, instead of these large underground facilities that some um, dark matter experiments are forced into. Um, oh, and here's a part of our collaboration, apple picking at our collaboration meeting last year. Um, so here is what our lab looks like. Currently um, on the left-hand side, side. So that's our dilution refrigerator system. Um, so that's what, what, what's going to provide the very, very cold temperatures. That will be connected to a system that's only just in a picture on a computer for now, um, but it'll look like that. So that'll, that'll be connected to this main cryostat. And inside of the main cryostat, um, we'll have this uh, detector, uh, which will be connected to the different uh, cooling stages, um, the different temperatures that we'll have available to us from that cooler. Um, and our detector has this has a toroidal magnet um, and a uh, inductor capacitor circuit um, as the resonator. Um, and here's what our magnet looks like more specifically. So it's a toroidal magnet. Um, so the wires are wrapped around the donut. Um, and the magnetic field goes as shown. So through, I guess, the inside of the donut. Um, and it'll be about a Tesla um, strength. And a Tesla strength is approximately what an MRI magnet is like. So it's strong, um, but I guess it could be stronger. Um, but this is what we're starting with. Um, the wires are wrapped around uh, uh, I guess what we call a mandrel, which is made of wedges. So there's an example of a wedge. So where we make the wedges and then we glue them together and then wind the wire around it. We're working with a company to help us do this because we're not magnet experts. Um, and so the company has started actually like winding our magnet, which is nice progress. Um, and there's an example where that's what they're, the pictures they've sent us of how they're doing winding um, the magnet. So hopefully, um, in a few months, we'll have our magnet. Um, so the magnet is now yellow here, um, and it's surrounded by a uh, superconducting material um, because the magnet is lossy, and it it's we like, and so and we can't have our resonator seeing loss. Um, because it has to be a very good resonator or else we, our noise will be uh, very high. And we won't be able to see the tiny, tiny little axion signal. Um, and our resonator is uh, made up of an inductor and a capacitor. Um, and why is an inductor capacitor combination uh, resonant? Uh, because the energy sloshes between the electric field in the capacitor and the magnetic field in the inductor. So they kind of just exchange the energy and, and, and resonate with some frequency. Um, the resonant frequency right, determines the, the mass of the axion that we can see. So it's a very important concept for us. It's really important for us to get the resonance frequency right. Um, and uh, 
DM, okay, DM radio can access lower masses than previous experiments. This is, uh, I guess, why we're even trying to build another experiment uh, compared to the other experiments that exist, because usually, um, or in some resonators, uh, the frequency is limited by the size of the resonator. And in using an LC resonator, we're not so limited by the physical size of the detector um, to, to tell us what our resonance is, where we limit it, or where it's determined, the resonant frequency is determined by the inductance and capacitance. And we need to be able to tune this. Uh, we need to be able to change the resonant frequency. Um, so we have a, a stationary inductor and then we have a tunable capacitor. So we'll have some kind of plates that move around and change the capacitance so we can change the resonance frequency and search for axions at different masses. Um, and this is a picture of our SQUID readout. Um, SQUID stands for Superconducting Quantum Interference Device. Um, and what our readout does is it converts the, the currents um, that we see from the axion interacting with the magnetic field. Um, so the currents in our resonator, in our inductor capacitor circuit, um, it converts them into something that we can actually measure. Um, and currently uh, there are good enough technologies at higher frequencies to be able to do a good job scanning uh, the different, um, the mass range up there. Um, but at lower frequencies, um, our electronics are currently not so good. Um, so we need to develop, or they're, they're okay. We can, we can have a chance at finding the axion, but it would take a long time to scan the whole available range. Um, and so then we have to try to develop new technologies to improve, um, improve the performance at lower frequencies. And that's what actually one of the goals of this experiment is, is to try to develop this technology so that future bigger detectors could use the technology and could scan um, the, the available axion parameter space faster. And this is what our cooler refrigerator looks like uh, inside. Uh, this was also on the title slide. Um, so on the left again, that's it closed up. Um, Blue Fours is the company that makes it. And then if you open it, um, so it has these different plates and the plates are at different temperatures. So I've labeled, there's like four Kelvin, there's a one Kelvin temperature stage. Um, and then there's an ultra cold plate, which gets down to 10 millikelvin. And to give you a sense of how cold that actually is. Um, so 300 Kelvin is approximately outside temperature. Uh, 255 Kelvin is like freezer temperature and 195 is dry ice. So that's already like a dangerous uh, temperature. So you really, okay, you don't want to touch it, but you also can't touch it because it'll be, it can't reach that temperature unless it's closed up in vacuum. It's a big deal to get that cold. Ah, and then there's the front view of this plate, very nice gold coating, a very reflective, um, good pictures. Um, so what are we trying to do? Where are we trying to search with DM radio? Um, this is again, the plot of axion mass on the x-axis and coupling strength on the y-axis. Um, so the shaded regions are, or in the colorful regions are the regions where we want to search with our three different proposed DM radio setups. DM radio 50 liter is the one that I focused on. So it's the, the one with the toroidal magnet that's going to be located at in the Stanford basement, uh, in the basement of the Stanford physics building. Um, and DM radio meter cubed is the one that will, or is one that a larger detector that will be located at Slack. And DM radio gut is further in the future. It actually requires the technology development that we need or that we hope to achieve um, through building uh, and working on the 50 liter version. And um, yes. And what does the field look like in general? I've showed a few pictures of the other experiments, um, but so far, okay, so this is again, axion mass on the x-axis. And this, this was focusing on the QCD axion, which is the one on those um, diagonal, I guess in the previous slide, the diagonal line, it's labeled there, QCD axion models. 
So to get down to that line, that's where the, the really popular axion models are. Um, so there are some bounds, um, the cosmological bounds, astrophysics, um, but in the 40 years that we've known about axions, the existing halo scopes, that's what we call like uh, scopes, they, they're experiments searching for dark matter in the, in the halo um, of our galaxy, um, have only excluded those shaded green um, areas. So there's a lot of parameter space that we are, still have to check. Um, and these ones in red are the, I guess, the, the ones that would or could uh, scan that parameter space in the next few years. Um, this plot was also, uh, I guess, as proof of it, its validity. Um, so this is in the, I guess, the community the dark matter community in general came together and wrote this report. Um, so it's not coming from me, it's coming from the community. Um, and then in the future, um, the community is very excited about all kinds of experiments that are being proposed that might happen in the next, um, that might come online in the next decade. So this is the future towards which we're looking in the community, very exciting. So in summary, um, there's a lot more dark matter than there is ordinary matter in our universe that we believe um, to be there. We're convinced. Axions are well-motivated um, wave-like dark matter because they also solve this mystery of the missing neutron electric dipole moment. Um, there's a wide range of axion masses still to check. And DM radio searching for actually on the lower side of um, the axion range um, through these uh, inductor capacitor resonators. Uh, and there are many planned axion searches um, that will hopefully soon search more of the range. Um, and to search the full range, new technologies are required. So we have to be at the forefront of technologies to be able or to have a chance at scanning all of the um, possible axion parameter space in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so thank you for listening and thanks, uh, Sinan and Katie and the kids and Richie. Well, thank you so much, Maria, for that uh, fascinating talk. And, and at this point, um, we would like to invite questions from you, our audience. Um, so first of all, those of you in the room, but also those of you online, um, I know you've been having a great conversation while Maria has been speaking, but if you have any further questions, do please ask them and we can, we can pass them up to Maria. Um, and yes, uh, starting with a question in the middle. So the, the question was, how do we know that it's not a standard model particle like rocks or dust and why do we need something else? Yes, because if it were a standard model particle, we would see it. I guess we understand the standard model particles well enough um, that we like we understand what their signals uh, look like going around. Um, so even rocks, like we see them. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thanks. Okay, uh, yes, at the front here. Does dark matter does it make sense to talk about the, the temperature of dark matter and does it radiate like a hot body? Uh, um, yes, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. So yes, yeah, so I guess the question was, does it make sense to, to talk about a temperature of dark matter and does it radiate? Yes. Um, so there's uh, been a lot of talk of like, like some people for a long time thought hot dark matter could be a thing, but right now, uh, We've convinced ourselves, I believe, uh, maybe not everyone's convinced themselves, that it is cold dark matter um, that is uh, the dark matter that we have now. So all of these candidates that are, are more popular are of the, the cold variety, I guess. Yeah. Thanks, Ed. So you talk about wave dark matter as being a, a solution to the, the problem of the missing matter, but... Um, I guess waves conjure up this picture of sort of ripples maybe on the, the surface of the ocean. So what does that mean for 
these dark matter particles? Can we think of them as being kind of spread across the universe like a wave or like a ripple? Um, yes, interesting. So this is more, uh, so the wave is kind of like each particle behaving like a wave. It's less of a like macroscopic structure and more of like a behavior, like a, a behavior of the of the small um, parts of the dark matter. Um, but there were there are people that believe that in like streaming dark matter. So it has nothing to do with like the wave like properties um, of each piece of dark matter. Um, but some people do believe there are like winds of dark matter that come through and they really encourage people like experimentalists to run their experiments fast enough to be sensitive um, to these streams of dark matter. Because in, like we as currently assume um, that dark matter is kind of always there all at the same time. Um, but yeah, some people think that sometimes it's more concentrated than other times. You can yeah. always trust a crazy theorist to come up with a new speed requirement for you or something, can't you? Yes, that's right. Um, so I guess you're going back to that, the, having, think of it as that the wave-like properties. Does that mean that it doesn't make sense to think about these particles as being in a single place, like a, a ball or something? Rather, each individual particle, it's kind of more fuzzy in its its location. That's right. Yeah, it's more like, I guess, there, so there's wave, maybe wave is a little bit confusing, but it's also like a field. So like, it's just, it's just average there everywhere, instead <laughs> of, instead of like in the wimp side of things, that like they wait for it to like hit in a specific location. We wouldn't wait for a specific location. We just assume that it's it's always there, everywhere in the galaxies. So we're talking of wimps. Um, AC online asked, "Is the wimp dead? And can you comment on how the axion fits into the picture of promising dark matter candidates?" Yes. Um, is the wimp dead? No, it's not dead. I just went to a conference where the wimp is very much alive um, uh, because I mean, most there's a bigger community. There's still a bigger wimp community and they're thinking of new and new, uh, new and better ways to try to get down further, um, have more sensitive detectors for wimps. Um, so it's just maybe surprising that we haven't seen it already if it's there, um, but it's not conclusively not there. Um, and how does the axion fit in? So actually, I mean, they both could exist. Um, they would just, I guess, each have uh, let or be a smaller part of the full dark matter than if it was just one of them, um, but they aren't mutually exclusive. Yeah. Sure. So we should be open-minded open and be open to there being multiple types even of, of dark matter. Um, and I guess I'll kind of on a related note, uh, G online asked, uh, can dark matter be explained by abundant stellar black holes or other clumps of gravitating material? Yeah. So I think um, from what I understand, um, people have thought of this, um, have thought about this a lot. Um, and maybe 10 years ago, it was not obvious that it can't be. Um, but I think in the last 10 years, there, there have been papers that come out, came out that people, where people really considered uh, black holes or some maybe more primordial about black holes to be um, the dark matter. But um, they decided it wasn't that. Yes, yeah, so I, I guess a, I trust them. Yeah. a black hole, at least not a primordial black hole, but at least a black hole that's formed at the end of a life of a star. That's still kind mm. of standard math, standard model particles. It's a star, normal stuff that's become it. And we still need to look beyond that to uh, different types of uh, material. Great. That's a question from the audience at the front there. Yes. Um, is, are you familiar with astrophysical evidence that would favor the light versus the dark? Dark matter. For hmm. instance, I think it was a recent paper that did some simulations that where they did simulations of uh, galaxies that were lensing. Uh, they concluded that the axion side of the thing, uh, dark matter was was big. So the the question was, um, is there any astrophysical evidence favoring either the the lighter dark matter or the heavier dark matter particles? I'm not sure. 
Um, <laughs> but I approve of this paper's message. Um, yeah, a lot of people, yeah, have a lot of thoughts about these things. Um, and especially like singular papers come out that uh, are probably very good ideas. Um, but yeah, I don't, I think so like, uh, I'm more familiar with like how axions fit into astrophysical evidence in general. Um, and they, I mean, I guess there's like more and more bounds that can be put on, on the axion given things that we continue to observe. Um, but they're still, yeah, very, uh, promising. And both, I guess both of them have like production mechanisms, um, that could work pretty well. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, I mean, axions being light, you might suppose that they would escape from the galaxies for periphery and some fraction of them would be you know, throughout the universe. Is this a reasonable thing? And would there be any effect for those? So the, the question was, um, if axions are light particles, do we reasonably expect them to be able to escape from their galaxies and be um, outside, outside of the galaxies across the universe? So again, from what I understand, um, uh, the, I guess, dark matter in general, so, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about like axions versus wimps, but dark matter in general is believed to be like clumped around the galaxies just because there's more um, stuff there that kind of uh, keeps it, uh, like attracts it um, gravitationally. Oh, if anyone else has an answer to this, you're welcome to step in. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, that that's right. I think because the the axions they're not actually within the the sort of the, the the smaller structure of the galaxy itself. We see we tend to think of the dark matter as being in this halo that sort of more extended around the galaxy. So gravity is still kind of clumping it together, and that's what gives the universe its structure. But it doesn't get pulled down to those those very small scales that we we see in the galaxies. Okay. Hydrogen escapes from the Earth. Oh. Then, you know, a lighter particle would more easily escape from the weakest gravity of the outside of the galaxy. Uh, but I guess by having enough of it, um, enough gravitation from all of the dark matter in the halo together, uh, kind of keeps the, the structure intact, if, if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, interesting thought. Uh, yes. What's the uh, timeline for the completion of your experiment? Okay, what is the timeline for the completion of your experiment? Are we allowed to ask? Great, nice. <laughs> According to my schedule, um, uh, the construction, I think in about a year. Um, by the end of the year, I hope, I am optimistic that we'll have the larger pieces um, like the cryostat, like the large cryostat and the magnet um, done. Um, there are smaller pieces and we need to like figure out how all the small pieces work together. I mean, we're working on doing that, but um, maybe it'll, I think it'll take another year realistically. So a uh, Scott online asks, um, would your detectors benefit from being in a radio quiet area or are they okay in a big metro area like this with all our radio stations and communications going on? Yeah, nice question. It would definitely be nicer to be in a quieter area, but it depends on the, the frequencies of this noise. So we're, we're interested, or uh, my detect or the, the 50 liter detector is like five kilohertz to five megahertz. Um, and whatever noise we see, uh, or we would definitely benefit from not having noise in that frequency range. Um, a lot of the noise we can kind of like shield from, we can deal with, um, being a noisy area by having like vibration isolation and like good shielding. Um, but still some, some random signals come in and we just have to understand that they're not the axion. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes, um, at the back. <laughs> yeah. What you from seeing the full range of, of the uh, axion, photon, couple, and range? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Just at the top end of that range, what's like the uh, most desirable range below you? So why, why can't you see down there? 
So why can't you see the full axion photon coupling range with your experiment? Why is your experiment just at sort of one end of the, the possible range of, um, of values that, that it's allowed to have? Yeah, so we, we can be sensitive down to that band. It would just, given the technologies, I guess, and limited time, um, it's not realistic for us to like try to get that low, um, uh, to, to do that full range. We could, um, I mean, the, so our, our, uh, the depth of our, uh, our, our, our sensitivity, um, depends on a lot of things, including like strength of magnetic field. We could pay more money to get a bigger magnet and then go lower or go faster across the range. Um, we could, okay, cooling down further is not really an option. We're cooling down as far as possible. Um, but we could have like better amplifiers, which is why we want to develop these new up amplifiers so that future experiments can use them and scan it in a, a reasonable amount of time. Um, but we could go down by just spending a long time and getting more data at that like one step. And then just spending more time at each step, we could go lower. It just, it would take a really long, it's like inefficient for us to do that. So better to start somewhere um then i guess to try to do everything all at once that's good and yes at the back as well uh, yeah how does the axion explain the lack of a dipole moment for the neutron great question how does the the axion explain the lack of the neutron's dipole moment yeah this, uh, this is it I, str I strongly recommend you go uh, and, and read about it. It's called, okay, str really the, the bigger, the underlying problem of um, the neutron not having electric dipole moment um, is the lack of um, CP charge parity symmetry violation in the strong interaction. Like that's what we predict. So like in our standard model, we can like write down equations of, um, like a Lagrangian or um, of how things interact. And um, that equation has a term um, that is there. It's like it's, uh, and it, it provides the like, vi the violation of this charge parity symmetry. And the axion allows like, um, or provides a mechanism to like relax that term to like zero. Um, so it's this kind of like many stage explanation um, of mostly math. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I guess it's kind of a fine tuning thing. Like on it, on its own, you would have this dial in the universe that you can change this this value, and it would totally change the way our universe works. And there's no particular reason why it has to have the value it does. But the axion comes along and it. It helps it guide it to the the value that it needs to have to uh, to match with what we see. And um, I think we've just got time for one more question. I, I think the hand over here went up first. Um, so I want to ask that. I mean, it's not about axioms, about uh, uh, the dual nature of the particles. So uh, since uh, you said that every particle it exhibits a dual nature, uh, what does it mean? Like uh, uh, you know, uh, at, at a collective level, like, you know, if there's a group of particles, each having a dual, you know, exhibiting a dual nature, what does it mean for a group of, like, particles? Like, you know, okay, so what does it mean for a group of particles to have this dual particle wave nature? So I guess it's, um, hmm. I'm not sure I understand the question very well, but I uh, think that it's, uh, it's kind of like the same thing on a larger scale where um, you don't need multiple particles to like, you know, have this interference pattern. But if you have more particles to uh, to interact, then um, maybe the intensity, I guess, of interaction maybe increases. You can re-ask the question or you can try to answer the question also. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I guess you just don't kind of imagine sort of lots of waves um interacting with each other in there in the, so the impact of each particle will still be you know, individual that's what you're saying oh would, would each particle still be an individual particle if it's this this sort of wave that's kind of fuzzy and kind of spread out 
or would yeah. you sort of measure the, the cumulative effects of all of them? Yeah, the more, uh, so um, yeah, I guess it depends on how you want to interact with it um, because you could, it's more like the lighter it is, the more like a wave it is, you get a cumulative effect and the heavier it is, the less often that you have this kind of, you experience this wave-like interaction with it. Um, so does that answer the question? I think that. Okay. Yeah, we can we can talk about it. Yeah. And then I, I guess we can just fit in one last question from J Knight Dynamic 42 online that's um, kind of related, I think. But why do you think that you would find one of these particles actually in your lab with with your experiment? Is that because they're kind of everywhere? Yes, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, because uh, right. So especially with axions, um, if they um, if they do account for all of the dark matter, um, each axion is tiny, um, is very small mass. So there needs to be a lot of them. So actually, like the axion density is crazy. Like it's there's like I don't know, maybe you know the number. It's like ten to the thirteen <laughs> axions per cubic centimeter or something. I'd say it's a big number. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's a lot of axions, especially around here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, excellent. Uh, thank you again for that wonderful lecture, Maria, and for these interesting uh, yeah, yeah. interviews. And just before we wrap up, we're going to tell you about a few more exciting events that we've got lined up for you. So the next event we have got in this series will be in about a month's time, in four weeks' time, on Monday, June 5th right here in this room on the Stanford campus, Hewlett Room 200, or of course, online. And Dr. Yella Albers will be presenting the next in our Dark Matter lecture series. And for those of you wondering if the wimp is dead or what's left for the wimp, Yella will be talking all about those particle-like possibilities for Dark Matter. But if you can't wait a month for our next event, we've actually got another astrophysics talk here at Stanford this week, organized by our physics department. This is the annual Robert Hofstadter Memorial Lecture, and we are pleased to be welcoming Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell from the University of Oxford on Thursday evening in Hewlett Room 201, that's the room just next door to here at 7.30 p.m., and she will be talking all about pulsars. And Jocelyn Bell Burnell is famed for being the graduate student who discovered pulsars. So uh, don't miss that if you want to find out all about pulsars. Finally, if you'd like to follow us here at KIPAC, find out about any of our future events, our public lectures, our stargazing, or the other fabulous events we offer, we'll be posting all of our upcoming events on our social media, on our website, and you can also sign up to our mailing list. So do please join us in the future. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone here tonight. Thank you to our technical team. Thank you to our online chat moderators. Thank you to Zinan. And of course, thank you to Maria for that fabulous lecture. And thank you to all of you for being such a wonderful audience. We'll be sending out a survey in the next couple of days. So do let us know what you think. But thank you so much and good night. <laughs>